The world is a big, dangerous, fascinating place, as my guest Stuart Sutton Jones knows all too well. He spent several years as a BBC reporter, focusing much of his reporting on the African continent. He now runs the Canadian chapter of the British program called Latitude, which places recent high school graduates in volunteer jobs in 20 different countries around the globe. And Stuart joins me in studio now. Thanks very much, Peter. You live in Vancouver now. Uh, you've been all over the world. I think Ghana has been sort of a second home to you because you, you've lived there for yep. quite a long time and, and your children are half Ghanaian. At, viewing the continent of Africa from this distance, what is it like watching what's going on there as an outsider? Well, of course, it's varied. Um, people from this part of the world or from distant seem to think that Africa is a homogeneous lump, and right. of course it's not. Um, Sarah uh, you, Palin thought it was one country, didn't she? Well, <laughs> yes, a country. There are 52 countries. Um, and if you uh, go from what is happening in South Africa, which is quite remarkable in economic and social terms, but still deeply flawed, and I'm sure we'll come back to that later, Ghana is um, proving to be a bastion of democracy. Um, its economy is um, strongly on an upswing. And yet there are also um, places of um, great stress and conflict. Um, Sudan is one example. Zimbabwe is the obvious example. Rwanda and Burundi and the Great Lakes region are just coming out of that and trying to form local alliances to maintain the peace into future generations. But So it's a, it's a, a continent of contrasts and it would be very difficult to do this in about two minutes to say it is just one thing. Um, one but is it difficult to watch what's going on there no, and not be there, not be involved somehow? Oh, absolutely. I mean, one of the, as I'm, I'm sure you know as a professional journalist, one of the um, beauties and seductive illusions of uh, being an international journalist is that you uh, get the impression that you participate in important things and you can also influence things. Influence things. Uh, the opportunities for direct influence do come, um, but they're very infrequent. And um, this, but this illusion of the, um, particularly from the West, of the um, uh, almost omnipotent reporter being parachuted into places of conflict and getting the story, and then in uh, uh, somehow changing events is mostly an illusion. Right. It does come on occasion, and uh, luckily I've only had it once in my life, but um, it uh, is otherwise um, a complete illusion. Mm. Well, let's talk about South Africa, because that's in the news now with the World Cup coming up soon. There's great concern about security in particular. Um, Al-Qaeda has even vowed to, to attack. Uh, are you concerned that uh, something might happen? Well, there's always the concern. I mean, uh, as uh, Vancouver showed during the Winter Olympics, as uh, Germany showed in the last um, uh, FIFA World Cup, the, uh, the success of such uh, um, events always depends on the stability and the comfort of the host nation. Um, and when Germany welcomed the world, when Vancouver welcomed the world, the world came. And there wasn't a great discrepancy or a disparity between the economic status of those visitors mm -hmm. and the host population it, um, a, 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 as, a general, as a generality. Right. So you would expect there to be very little conflict. Um, it was a stable, um, mildly policed society in Germany, mildly policed society in Vancouver for the Olympics. As a consequence, everybody had a heck of a party. It was great. Right. And but South people, Africa is never a mildly policed. Well, I mean, and that's the problem, because um, the, uh, you're going to have actually people from rich countries, particularly in Northern Europe and also um, uh, from uh, North America, the developed countries are going to be coming, supporting their national teams in droves to a country which is still suffering massively from great poverty and inequity. I mean, and crime is just rampant. People well, it, live, it, 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 regular people live in barbed wire fenced homes. Well, um, uh, uh, the sort of middle class population have fenced themselves off into their um, gated compounds, but the majority of the population who are greatly disadvantaged uh, are going to be the ones who are going to face the brunt um, of all the policing and the militarism that's going to have to go on um, from the outside, it seems, which is necessary to keep things secure. But we may be surprised. I mean, the South African, uh, generally speaking, is um, a wonderfully welcoming and, uh, and um, hospitable person. And the generality of the population might take this opportunity to say, we will try and insulate all visitors from those gangs that gen genuinely do exist and make it a very risky place. Um, well, Zimbabwe and, and, and South Africa were often put together as, as these great potential nations in, in Southern Africa. Um, South Africa has done relatively well economically. Zimbabwe has kind of fallen off the cliff in, yeah. in many ways politically. Do you see South Africa following in Zimbabwe's roots? No. Um, uh, while they continue at a, a, a broadly democratic 
uh, structure with um, a vocal opposition that still um, is respected in the generality of the population and it is not um, looked upon as um, solely tribally based or ethnically based whether you're the m tiny tiny minority of the white population supporting one party and so on right. um, then I think that there's um, uh, no reason to think that it will go uh, pear-shaped uh, Zimbabwe is a unique example um, driven as much by the uh, um, instability of its leader and but does it uh, come down to Mugabe I mean, when Mugabe's gone will I mean Saddam was gone yep. and troubles didn't disappear I mean different troubles exist in, in Iraq now even though the dictator is gone what 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 happens when Mugabe's gone well, it depends very much on what um, the successors want of the people who can properly bankroll the country. At the moment, the country is supported by a few states, interestingly, most particularly by China, mm -hmm. which has got um, a, a decades-long relationship with um, uh, Mugabe personally, but also with his political party, party ZANU, ZANU PF. And um, they've supported him for, for many, many years. Um, so, uh, but after Mugabe goes, there are a lot of people within ZANU-PF, very close to Mugabe, who for about the last 10 years have been uh, worried and dissatisfied with the way the country has gone. It is, as, you, as we know, it's a cliche. The economy has imploded. It was the breadbasket of Southern Africa. Right. It fed seven or eight countries, and now it's a basket case. And 80% of uh, Zimbabweans are unemployed. This is the result of a single policy and however justified it may seem to achieve the goal of that policy, which is the redistribution of land and the inequities that came from colonialism, the way that it was done has destroyed the economy and hurt um, the, the great majority of Zimbabweans. So, in answer to your question, how is he go what's going to happen? It all depends what happens at the next echelon down. Mm -hmm. I imagine that they would want to build bridges with the West um, as quickly as possible to try and get the country back on track. Mugabe is a particular personality with an enormous stature and history. Had you ever met him? I met him, yes, indeed. Uh, in, what was but that like? o o only in the late 70s, um, at the time of the Lancaster House Agreement. And when I was living in Zimbabwe uh, uh, about six or seven years ago, I didn't meet him, but I re met all my old friends or his colleagues. Mm -hmm. And um, they gave me some very interesting insights into um, his psychology at the time. So you were in uh, Zimbabwe when the sort of the, the, the land grabs were happening, right? Yes, I was. I mean, yes, absolutely. Whites were really no, no, no. targeted. Uh, as I, I, I met um, several farmers who had been kicked off their land the day, the day that it happened. Um, and also some of the ministers. It was very interesting. Um, there was a, there's a formal rule, of course, that uh, uh, only one person can have one farm. This was what redistribution of the land was all about. Just to back up a little, the problem is that um, under colonialism, 95% of the population was restricted to the worst 15% of the arable land. Mm -hmm. That meant there was enormous pressure. So redistribution of land was the fundamental reason for the Bush War, which led to the um, uh, war in Zimbabwe, uh, in Rhodesia, which led to the Lancaster House Agreement and the creation of Zimbabwe. And the West, in most particularly Britain, was obligated under that agreement to pay for that redistribution of lad, land. And successive governments, Tories and Labour government in Britain, reneged on that agreement. And it was only when Mugabe was in his late 70s and um, in 1997, 98, that he decided, as a colleague of his told me personally, Comrade Robert wants to do something irreversible because he knows he's only got a few years let, left. And that's what has happened. He's done something completely irreversible, but at the expense of the Zimbabwean population. Well, let's hold there for a moment, because we have to take a break. But you mentioned China. China has been Absolutely. influential throughout the continent. We'll talk about that and about the success story, one of the success stories, Ghana, when we return with Stuart Sutton Jones.